Um, Dave's going to come and preach now, but before, before Dave comes up to preach, I just want us to massively honour Dave and Liz. Um, I, I shared it a few weeks ago when Ben preached, uh, just a cultural thing that I noticed when I was up at the King's Arms in Bedford. They are so good at honouring people and honouring them in all they do. And this is a couple that, again, behind the scenes in lots of times, but you will see it publicly as well. They have been an absolute support to me and Wendy and Andy and Lynn, uh, to David and to others alongside Clive. Us as a team here, we would be so unable to do all that we do locally without the support of these two, being part of their family of churches. And so, you know, it just has. It's just been a huge, huge comfort to us. And as well, we talk about courage here. It's one of our cultures. Courage just means someone put in uh, encouragement. So it just means someone putting courage into you. And that's what I've found from, from Dave. It's just constantly someone who's saying, putting courage into your heart. Say, come on, you can do this. God's good. He's leading you in these things. Trust him. And so can we just show our appreciation and thanks to Dave and Liz as Dave comes up to speak. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, it's tremendous to be here today. And uh, just to be singing is just such a joy. Uh, some of those songs, back when things were kind of very nervous and we were kind of just a few people in a building with masks and actually not supposed to sing. Um, singing songs like Sing a Little Louder was a bit ironic. You couldn't sing at all. So actually, when we have moments like this where we so I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm, I'm gonna, I will not be quiet, we will not be quiet, these are really wonderful moments when once again in the presence of God we're able to express our love for him and our joy in his presence. Hallelujah. I just want to back up the announcements that Ollie made right at the beginning. I've had the joy behind the scenes of partnering uh, with Clive Chernick and uh, John Groves, late of this parish. Um, and some of you will know these guys. And these proposals, these decisions about future elders have come like through a number of us just talking and praying together, which is really fantastic. And then just to say this about Ollie, that um, we have real peace about the fact that he's meant to lead this team as they emerge, that he's kind of the lead elder. We talk a lot about plurality of elders, which is a biblical thing, but we also believe someone needs to lead that team, and we believe that guy to be, to be Ollie. And uh, I've watched him, you know, it's not just the last 18 months. Those of you who've been around for longer have known he's kind of had to lead through other difficulties that you faced as a church, and then watching him just kind of rise to the occasion during these last... 18 months. I know several friends of mine who, who are leading churches at the moment and they all kicked off about the same time and within three or four months the pandemic hit and it's kind of like that was their introduction to full-time ministry. I think Ollie's just done an outstanding job in terms of leading you as a people so praise God for that. I also managed to persuade him to stop the teaching career that he's had as well. So he's now <laughs> full-time amongst you as a church, which is, which is fantastic. And as we've hinted already this morning, you do sense as you go around the country in churches that a new season is beginning to emerge. And I don't mean by that just bigger gatherings, but a sense of God doing something new amongst us as a people. And again, I know lots of people are standing in pulpits like this, very patient, very kind, very slightly nervous about kind of looking forward because we've lived in a year and a half of uncertainties, so you never quite know, you know, we could announce things today and in two months' time it might revert. But as a general principle, just the sense of God saying, you are supposed to start looking forward now. You are supposed to believe in God for a new way to, to do church and to do life in this new world in which we are moving towards. And I'm so thrilled that you're kicking off with a week of prayer because there's no better way to find God's will for you as a church community 
than in prayer. There's no better way to start to look forward to a new direction, as it were, than soaking everything in prayer. So my encouragement for as many of you as possible, however you do it, to find ways to come and to pray and seek God together. And as you know, we're part of a family of churches called New Ground, and New Ground has had to go through lots of changes, and we've also, just like local churches, gone through loads of difficulties. And we've not been able to travel, and we've not been able to initiate very much. But praise God, the shoots of new life amongst us as a family and internationally are beginning to kind of come through the surface again. I was yesterday at our London-based academy with 140 new students and just a sense of momentum and gathering there and we've started bases all over. We estimate 500 people now doing some of that leadership training, which is terrific. And we're also starting to pray and thinking to church plants and how we begin to do them. And even as I speak, a couple from the UK based at King's Church Catford called Phil and Sarah Varley have arrived in Rotterdam in Holland where we are now starting to plant a church uh, in Rotterdam. It's just little shoots, little encouragements, but they're just signs that God is taking us into a new season. I hope you feel that individually and I hope you feel that corporately as King's Church as well. And if there are some of you today here that wonder, will that, will that, maybe one day I'll get involved in a church plant or maybe some people from King's will go across this nation and across the nations of the world and plant churches. And if that kind of buzzes with you, can I just encourage you, we have an online, I have to get this right, an online church planting conference that we're running on Friday evening the 24th of September and Saturday the 25th. And New Ground and Relational Mission, another sphere in New Frontiers, have come together and we're doing this church planting conference. And all you have to do is go to the New Ground website, press on events and sign up. It's not very complicated. And you don't even have to leave your house. You could even be in your pyjamas and no one will know. It's just simple. And you can, you're just welcome to come and join us. We want people who are just wondering about church planting in the future, which will be great. You know, I think these last 18 months, COVID has been for some people just a bit of an inconvenient interruption. And I understand why people feel like that, but in the purposes of God, I absolutely, absolutely don't believe that's what it is. I think this season has been for us an essential time of preparation for what God has for us in the future. I would go as far as to say there was a church pre-COVID, lots of leaders are talking like this, but as you look back, I'm not so sure it was equipped and ready to go into what God has got for us in the future. But there's a, co- a post-COVID church that's coming out of all of this, having learnt lots of things and still learning lots of things, that position us for what God has got for us in the future. This hasn't been an inconvenient interruption for you as an individual either. You know, God has been doing stuff in you that you're not even aware of right now, but one day you're going to see it for what it really is. Do you know, if this had gone on for six weeks, don't you ever think about that? Some of us, oh, I've only it had gone on for only six weeks. But if it had gone on for only six weeks, I think we'd have shrugged our shoulders and just got on with normal life. Just inconvenient. But it hasn't. And I believe that means for us that God wants to do something far deeper and far more radical amongst us as his people. And it's not just for our sake, it's for the nation's sake. The Church of Jesus Christ, we've just heard this wonderful word about Kenilworth Castle. I stayed for a week in a a little Airbnb opposite Kenilworth Castle. So as he was speaking, I was just thinking, I can see it. That's not our future, going backwards into ruin. And one of the reasons is for the sake of the UK. Because we have a message and a gospel and good news and life to give to a a nation which, let's be honest, is more shattered than it was before all this happened. Jesus is the answer. And you and I have that message within us. 
But you know, one of the things that I think has happened during COVID for many of us is that it's knocked our confidence. It's knocked our confidence in things like, well, what will the church be like? Or it's knocked our confidence in so many ways. Let's be honest, for some of us, it's knocked our confidence in God and the God we thought we knew. It's knocked our confidence in his purposes. It's, it's made us have to dig deep into what do I really believe. If you've gone through that over the last 18 months, you're not alone. Maybe it's knocked our confidence in the church. I know I've had to dig deep over this last 18 months into to what I believe and into my relationship with God as other things are stripped away from us. Faith has been challenged and faith being challenged is not at all a negative thing, but a really good positive thing. Because if faith is challenged and it doesn't turn into unbelief, it becomes something so much stronger. And some of you believe more as a result of these last 18 months rather than less. It is a season where we have had to say so often, I just don't know what's going on. So we've had to learn to go to what we do know and not stay with where, where we don't know. And our confidence has surely been rocked. It's been knocked. So what I want to do today in these next few moments is I want to try and bring a word to you as individuals and to kings as a church to rebuild any of that confidence that may have been knocked. And your confidence is not in yourself. And your confidence is not in meetings and buildings. Your confidence is not even new elders that will be appointed at the beginning of next year. Your confidence is in him Amen. and in him alone. I really enjoyed listening to Clive's word from last week from Ecclesiastes and Shakespeare. I thought it was terrific. And uh, he talked about casting bread on the waters and sowing seeds. And I'm going to preach a word this morning about, uh, about seeds. I really want to carry on from some of the things that Clive shared with us last year. And Andy and, and uh, Ollie heard me preach a word a couple of years ago to leaders about this subject. And they said, please, could you kind of bring this to the church? And I've kind of worked on this. And I really believe God wants to speak to some of us as individuals and as a corporate church through uh, through this message today about God planting seeds. And if you have the Bibles with you, you'd like to turn to Isaiah chapter 9. <clears throat> and very familiar verses from verse 6. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Did you ever understand that Jesus was like a seed planted into this world, the incarnation, the virgin birth, a seed that would bring Jesus, give Jesus life, overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, but a seed just like you as a seed, consummated, you as a seed that became a human being. Jesus was this, for unto us a child is born, unto us the world a son is given. It's a seed given into the world. And at that moment the seed was planted, the DNA for everything that was to follow was in that seed right at the beginning. And what was to follow, look at it please in the next verse, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Once the seed's been planted, the DNA is increase. The DNA is growth. The DNA is multitudes of men and women around the planet, like you and me here this morning, having our lives <coughs> transformed. 
And I just love this last part of verse 7. And the zeal of the Lord will do this. Isn't it amazing that he is more zealous for the success of his son and the gospel than you and I are? Or the most radical evangelist in the world? The truth is this, that it's not up to you and me to get King's Church to where it would be on our own. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish the increase of his government and peace that will be no end is in his camp. I was reading a book by Andy McCulloch called Global Humility. Has anybody read Andy McCulloch's book, Shame on All of You Apart from the Front Row? (laughs) Global Humility is an outstanding book about mission. And in there, he uses this phrase, and the phrase is the title of my word today, All the tree is in the seed. I'll repeat it. All the tree is in the seed. It sounds strange, doesn't it? It's not in the Bible. Shakespeare wasn't in the Bible either, so I'm on good ground. It's probably a Chinese proverb. I don't know. But it just confirms what the Bible says. All the tree is in the seed. And when a seed is planted, listen, all that is needed for it to become a tree is already there. It doesn't come later. It becomes at the moment that it's planted. In a minute, you're going to see why this is so so important for our future. The DNA, God said to Adam and Eve, multiply. Seed started one seed, one child, but the DNA was there to fulfill the promise that they would multiply throughout the earth. Abraham was told that you will be the father of many nations. Go and count the stars, Abraham, the grains of sand. Can you count them? So will your offsprings be. The DNA for all that happened when Isaac was born. It only took one to accomplish the purposes of God. Jesus, the Bible says, is the firstborn of a new creation. And when you get to heaven, you find it's described as there were multitudes so great around the throne of heaven, of every tribe, every tongue, every nation, that it could not even be counted. And it started with the virgin birth. It began with one seed. All the tree is in the seed. The day of Pentecost, I can see I'm getting some of your attention now, was just like a seed that was sown, the beginning of the church. All that was needed for that tree to grow was on the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that day. Because the DNA of that seed, 2,000 years later, has never been thwarted and has never been removed. And it's still growing in the earth today. We moved to our house about 20 years ago. And one of the things Liz decided to do, the garden is her world. I sit and look at it. And she does all the work. She gets, you know, I do cut the lawn actually, but everything else she does. It's not a particularly large garden, but for some reason she decided this garden needs some trees. And so one day... I didn't even know she'd done it. She told me ages later she planted some seeds in our garden. Now, there is a wall at the back of our garden and there are neighbours beyond that. I haven't seen that wall or those neighbours for as long as I can remember because those seeds became became trees that just grew and grew and grew. You cannot see the garden for these massive trees. And every now and then I've said to Liz, darling, you know, it's just a tree, it's like an orchard that you've planted. It's like there's just trees everywhere that you've established. Can't you kind of cut them back? So she pruned them. And guess what happens when you prune a tree? I can't even hear my neighbours now, let alone see, which is not a bad thing, right? I'm just amazed that within 20 years, that's how long we've lived there, this little seed. But you know, when she planted the seed, all that was necessary for them to become what they are today was there at that moment. 
Yes, she's watered and pruned and cut back, etc. But the DNA in that seed was there. Now, please listen this morning. This is really important. When God plants a seed in you, all the potential for all that God has ordained in that seed is there at that moment. And COVID, there's not been a chance that it could even begin to destroy or interrupt the seed that God has planted in you. This is a word for some of us who've had our confidence knocked over this time about what it really means. And when a seed was sown, I have no idea, it was decades, wasn't it, that this church was planted. But the moment a seed was sown in King's Church, all the tree was in that seed. All sorts of things can happen, ups and downs and disappointments and all sorts of opposition, but it's never going to thwart what God has begun. Whatever God does in the nations, the DNA of that seed being sown is growth and fruit, which is always going to come to pass. I just love this verse, Colossians 1, verse 5. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you. As indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing. As it also does among you, listen, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. It's an amazing statement. Do you know that all around the world today, the gospel is advancing and growing it's never going that way. It's always going this way. It's never diminishing. It's always growing. And that's the, the, the DNA of the seed in you and in all of us. And if you oppose what God has done, if you oppose the seed in your life or in the life of the church or in the life of the nations, if you try to stop it, it'll only cause even more growth. It's not a good plan to persecute the church. Bad news. You know, if a seed li lies on the top of the soil, not much is going to happen. But if you start to dig it down underground, it only produces more fruit. I was in contact in the early days of COVID with a pastor in China who said to me, they've stopped us. We're not allowed to meet in our buildings and we might never be able to meet in our buildings. And so we've all gone back into our homes. I said, David, that's where we first started. So we've just gone back to where we first started and the authorities don't understand that we grow more in our homes than we do in our buildings. That church is over 10,000 people right now. I mean, it's just a sign of the promise of God in his word for us. I think Clive quoted this last week, but here we go, just quote it again, John 12, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a green of, grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies... It bears more fruit because the, the DNA of the seed is not to die but to grow. Folks, if God is for us, who can be against us? And COVID experience for many of us is a kind of death. The one thing it's not stopped is what God has started in you as an individual or you as a people which is why COVID could never thwart God's purposes in you, in kings, in new ground, in new frontiers, the whole worldwide body of Christ. Because actually it's always going to bear more fruit. I want to very quickly and practically share with you four biblical principles, if I may, ab about seeds. Number one, God initiates. He initiates it. He plants this, not you. And this is so vital for us to understand this. All you need to know is that he is the one who began it and started it. That's all you need to know. Ephesians 2 describes you and me. It says we were dead in our transgressions and sins. But because of the love and mercy of God, we have been made alive in Christ Jesus. You didn't do that. What were you? Dead. Completely dead. And, and unless 
Things have changed under COVID. I think dead people still do what dead people do, which is nothing. You can't breathe life into yourself if you're dead. That's how the Bible describes you and me. But a day came, listen, when God broke in and a seed of life came into you and me. And at that moment you were born of the Spirit. A seed came into your life and though you were dead, you were now made to be alive. I was raised in a Christian family in a kind of lively Baptist church and I was a complete and utter rebel and I hated everything about it. It, There's no church kid that's ever been raised in any church that doesn't know how to be more rebellious and destructive than me. If you've got ideas that I never thought of, come and see me afterwards, but I think I knew most of them. I was just bad news. My parents run the youth group in our our church, and basically when they met in our home, I was down the pub. And they never knew, they still don't know this till this day. In fact, they're probably going to listen to this sermon and think, really? Is that where he was? I mean, I just was really bad news. I was a back row Baptist kid who was just waiting to get out of it. And then one day, God planted a seed, which I didn't deserve, into my life. And everything that's happened in my life from that day till this is not because of me, but because he broke into my life and began a journey. It was his seed in me that created, I don't know if I am a tree, but all the tree of my life was in that seed, that moment I became miraculously born again in a way that I did not deserve it. God has initiated. What is the basis this morning of your confidence in what God has done and is doing in your life? The confidence is that he began it. And the confidence is that you may not feel you're doing very well this morning. You may have felt these last 18 months you've done even worse. Let me tell you, your confidence is in this. If he's planted a seed in you, this is going to produce life and fruit in you. If God planted a seed that made King's Church become a reality, if God planted a seed in new ground, which means it became a reality and it's now growing into a tree, if God did these things, then there's nothing that's going to thwart it. I'm really excited about this plant into Rotterdam. Do you know why? Because it wasn't our idea, it was God's idea and it's miraculously confirmed it and there's been prophecies and provision and all sorts of amazing things. Will that plant succeed? The answer is yes, because the seed has been sown and it will produce life. I really believe this morning that there are some people here today and I'd love to pray for you at the end of this meeting who have had their confidence knocked in themselves because somehow you feel it's up to you to make this thing work. And your confidence has got to be in God. Has he done a work in your life? He will surely bring it to fruition. Second principle is this. God sustains it. He waters it. He cares for it. He nurtures it. He protects it. Our confidence is in the fact that God not only initiates by planting the seed, but it's up to him to be the one who sustains it. If you think I've got to keep this thing going now that he's broken into my life, the answer is no, you don't. Yes, you have a part to play. You also need to water and nurture and protect what God has put within you. But it's not down to you, it's down to his ability to look after that which he has planted and established. Jesus said, none shall pluck you out of my hand. The Bible says nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You are not clinging on to God. His everlasting arms are beneath you. He's got hold of you, not you are trying to cling on to him. He not only has initiated, but he's committed to stay with you till the very end. Jesus said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You don't carry God through your life. He carries you. Whatever you've experienced during COVID, he has continued to sustain 
that which he has begun. I love this psalm, Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Look at this, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you. He will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in. He's living in a society at the moment. Do I go out or do I stay in? Do I go into the shop or do I stay? Do I wear a mask or do I not? All those things are important, but behind it all is a sovereign God who's protecting your life. He is the one to remove fear from your life because he is the one who's with you even in your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Man's opposition, schemes of the enemy, a liberal agenda entering the church. None of these things will prevent God's ability to protect and keep and sustain that which he has, he has begun. Which is why the church in China today is thriving so much because so many people have tried to, to, to bring it to an end and every time they do, God sustains it and brings it to health and strength. Do you know there are people in Europe that want to blot out the church of Jesus Christ. They don't want us to be around. There are, there's an agenda in Europe to just remove Christians from any walk of life and just blot us out. It's too late. The seed has already been sown. The DNA is already in the mixture of Europe. If you know your church history, you'll know for centuries. Revival after revival. It's just too late. It can't help but succeed because God sustains it. Principle number three, we go real quick. It always starts small and then it always grows. It's never the other way around. I said that once and someone said to me, yeah, but the day of Pentecost started big with 3,000. I said, have you read the rest of the chapters? Gets to 5,000. Luke's a great guy. He's charts and he tries to chart the numbers and then about chapters 7, 8, 9, 10, he just gives up and says, oh, multitudes were coming to faith. <laughs> All of Asia heard. You know, he's just, he tries to count, but he's, the principle is what God starts, it always goes in the direction of growth. It never starts here and goes backwards, which is why Canalworth is such an interesting castle for us. Our future is not erosion and ruin. Our future is this mighty kingdom of the increase of his kingdom and peace. There will be no end. And it starts like a little stone and it grows into a mighty, mighty thing throughout the earth for the glory of God. All the tree is in the seed. If it starts small, Here's the DNA, growth. I mean, this is just such a great word for people in planting churches. Just started out and then COVID hit and you can't even meet. And the temptation is when you're in a church plant to say, can we have more resources, please? Can we have more money? Can, we go, can you go to King's Eastbourne and tell them to send out 35 of their fit troops? And come and, come and help us. You know, can, can, we, need, we need more more resources. When all that dies, here's the truth. All the tree is in the seed that planted you. It's just, it's just amazing to be in a group of 35 people in Berlin and just keep reminding yourself of that all the time. God has spoken. God planted this. All the tree is in the seed. He's going to do this because it always starts small and gets large. I said earlier, Abraham started with one child became multi, multi-nations. Pentecost started with 120, actually. That's a bit of improvement on one, 120. But they were locked away for fear of anyone coming to destroy. Not a good start when the gospel was about going to the ends of the earth. Each local church, including kings, 
has a seed planted, and let me remind you of your DNA, that you started small, but you're going to grow larger. Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Did you know that's in your DNA? You might not like Judea, you might not like the Samaritans, you might not be even interested in the, in the ends of the earth. Tough, it's going to happen anyway. Because this is in your DNA. Do your Jerusalem, Eastbourne. Do your Judea the surrounding area, do your Samaria, you know, the people we don't get on with naturally, the French, I don't know, something like that, <laughs> whatever's the equivalent, just over there. And even to the ends of the age, right through the nations of the world. A lady spoke to me at the end of a meeting back at my church at home in London and it was just at the end of the meeting. She'd been in that church for a few years and she said, David, I just want you to know I'm leaving. And I said, that's really, really sad. Why are you leaving? Is it something we've said? If we offended you, is it something doctrinal? Please tell me because we'd love to make a change. She said, no, no, no. The church is just growing. It's just too big for me. I said to her, but that's a good news, isn't it? She said, yeah, but I just can't, I'm not comfortable. It's just big news. It, it, it's just too big. It grows. So that's the basis that she left. She went and joined another church about three or four miles away because it was smaller. That church quadrupled in the next two years. <laughs> Sadly, she then left that church and she went to another church which began to grow. As far as I know, she's still travelling around trying to find a church that has a seed that doesn't grow. <laughs> now, I don't want to be, you know, as churches, we need to provide wineskins when we grow to ensure things like relationships and discipling one another stays absolutely... Last thing Kings wants to do is just draw a crowd on a Sunday. Half of, full of people that just like coming to be entertained. Our responsibility is to make disciples, which means that the future wineskins, lots of pastors are thinking about this all over the place at the moment. Our future wineskins is not so much centred on the big crowd on the Sunday, good though that is, but actually are looking for creative ways that we might keep in relationship. However big it gets, it stays small. The, you know, that was 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. The next verses talk about intimacy, homes, hospitality, sharing our lives with one another. You can be 3,000 and still be intimate. we still need to embrace growth. I believe that King's Church is going to grow beyond where you are at the moment because of this seed and this DNA, all the trees in this seed. And I'd love you to embrace that. The assurance of growth is not techniques, it's the assurance of a promise. It's the assurance of unto you a child has been given, a son has been given. And the increase is upon his shoulders. Hallelujah. Families grow, don't they? Have you noticed that? Just a little seed. Families grow. Liz and I had four kids. They all got married. They've now got grandkids. We've got grandkids. <laughs> so we get together now in our immediate family. There are 23 of us. And my sisters have both got kids, married to kids. And it, I mean, what began a few years ago is just kind of like crazy because all the tree is in the seed. Finally, number four. This seed is eternal. Do you know that there's something of eternity in you today? 1 Peter 1, 23. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. Will you make it to the end? The answer to that question is, if God has planted a seed of eternity in you, that seed doesn't belong to this world, this temporary passing world. You are going to make it because the guarantee is that the seed has already been established within you. Folks, Christians don't start eternal life the moment their physical bodies die. They start eternal life the moment the seed of being born again enters your life. You can't kill a Christian, you can only transfer one from one place to another. 
One day you just slip away from this mortal coil and you know what it says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5? You will be swallowed up by life. Just imagine that. This tiny little seed has been planted in you and the Bible says the outer man is wasting away. Has anybody noticed that? That the inner man is being renewed and what happens is you're, you're moving towards the finality of your life and this outer thing is kind of decreasing but the, seed, the reason for that is the seed in you is getting ready for a new body and it's like the, a, a, eternal life is like a wave coming towards you. Some of you have been uh, to the beaches this year and some of you go into the sea and, you're, you're, and then one wave comes and knocks you over with great power, you didn't see it coming. That's what it's going to be like for you the moment you die. You're walking towards not death, but one day you will be swallowed up by life. If the seed of eternity, the imperishable seed, everything else will perish, but what God has put you in, in you will never perish. That's true of you as an individual. It's true of us as a church. You are the bride of Christ. I've read the back of the book and we're there the marriage supper of the Lamb for eternity. Because the church has got an eternal element about us that's not of this world that goes on into eternity. And all of this, this morning, has been a kind of attempt to restore confidence that's been knocked. In fact, I go further, to increase confidence in the one who initiates, the one who sustains, the one who is committed to cause it to grow, and the one who is eternal. There's no message that you are going to hear that's going to give you more confidence than that. One of the musicians just come back and join me. What I'd like to do is apply this word to people around this room today. The Holy Spirit just to come and to sort of massage what he's saying to us this morning. So can we just close our eyes just for a moment? Just going to apply this to two areas. And then what I would like to do is ask you to stand where you are. No, no one's going to come to the front, just to stand where you are. If you know today you would like us to pray for you. And then maybe one or two people will just reach out their hands and pray for you. We do this in a very... COVID sensitive kind of way not forcing anybody hallelujah Lord I want to pray for people here today who are individuals who've really been through it the last 18 months maybe even longer and these days that we've lived through have caused loss anxiety, maybe some disappointments and frustrations, maybe your health has been affected, if not physical, maybe mental or emotional. Some of you have felt the pain of isolation, loneliness and personal struggles. And it's just not your confidence. Here's the word of the Lord to you today. All of that has been real. It's been a reality. But there's a seed in you. And you might not know this, but all through all your struggles, the seed's been growing. You think it's actually not, but it has, because through struggles and difficulties and toils and snares and tribulations, he grows us. Some of you are growing through this. In the moment, I'd love to pray for individuals all around this room who know that's me. And today, I just want to come and acknowledge the seed in me and to pray the breath of God will come upon you and give you confidence once again. Secondly, to pray for people here today who've had their confidence knocked in the church. Maybe you've been here many years at King's and there's been ups and downs and disappointments and misunderstandings. But today the word of the Lord to you is, you know, King's is a seed planted by God. 
And there's a new season coming. And over kings that God initiated, he will sustain this church. He will cause it to grow. He will cause the vision to become a reality, take it through to eternity. Can I just say this, folks, if you believe that, that we've hardly begun. Praise God for the last however many years, but this is not the end. And COVID just propels us into a new season of more. There's a new season coming. Some of us just need to draw a line today and come again with confidence in God and in the Jesus who is surely building his church. If you would like prayer this morning, I'd just like to invite you just to stand where you are so that people can see you, so we can pray for you. Please don't hesitate. I know we're all coming back into normal church. I've found so far everything we do, we're all a bit kind of not match fit and we're just kind of getting back on the pitch again. So if you know that's you today, would you stand where you are? Because we'd love to pray for you. If you know your confidence has been knocked a bit in church and what it is, I want you to stand as well. Holy Spirit, just come right now. It's going to give you another minute. Don't hesitate this morning. Otherwise, I'm looking at one very, very confident church and this message still needs to be applied. Holy Spirit. If you can see someone standing close to you, just reach out to them where you are. I think you're permitted just to put a hand on the shoulder. Holy Spirit, come today. Thank you, Jesus. It's wonderful to see people beginning to respond. If there's someone standing near you and they still haven't got someone praying, I don't want anyone to miss out. And if you still want to stand, now's an opportunity. Father, we pray for individuals here today who've struggled in different ways. Confidence has been affected. As we pray now in the name of Jesus, we invite your Holy Spirit just to come and restore confidence in people's lives. By your Spirit, for people who've had their confidence knocked in maybe ups and downs, things have happened in church. Restore, Lord, confidence in in your sovereignty, in your plans, in your purposes. Nothing can thwart what you have begun. Breathe upon us today, Holy Spirit. Just as people are praying for one another, for the rest of us, I just want to finish by just saying, this, this final thing, as we emerge from all we've been through, as we emerge into a new season, there's a desperate need for us to have a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon all of us. I just can't think of anything more that would renew us and refresh us and restore us and rebuild us and get us match fit than a fresh encounter of the Holy Spirit. You up for that? It's not our enthusiasm or our running around in circles. It really is a fresh outpouring of the Spirit. I pray, even during this week of prayer coming up and beyond, that there would be a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit not only in kings but right through your church we're just not interested in labels and denominations we just want you to come to refresh your church and renew your church and restore what's been lost 
that we might be equipped and empowered to serve this desperate generation that do not know you have been through such troubles recently that you will come afresh.